Where does happiness come from? That's what we're answering on this week's video. We're going over the best 10 ideas from the happiness hypothesis. What's up guys, Clark back for this week's review. Thanks for tuning in uh, from ClarkDanger.com and MyBestJournal.com where you can change your life in four hours. But today we're going over this book, really excited because this was one I found in college and it really made things click in my head. It also gets the award for probably dirtiest, most highlighted coffee stained book I own. Um, it's by Jonathan Haidt, Finding Modern Truth and Ancient Wisdom. Jonathan goes over 10 big ideas of what makes us happy. He looks at everyone from Plato, Socrates, Buddha, Jesus, uh, people who have proposed theories and ties them to science and kind of merges the best of everything. So I'm really excited to dive into this book. Again, it's one of my all-time favorites. Definitely a good read. Check out the description if you want to follow along with some notes on this um, or not. But let's dive into this right now. The first big point is the divided self. When we're talking about us, there's a lot of divisions people seem to draw. There's the mind body, left brain, right brain. Uh, Freud had the id, super ego, and super id. So Jonathan in this book divides us into, uh, he uses a, a metaphor. That metaphor is right on the cover there. See that? It's the uh, elephant and the rider. And that the mind and the body oftentimes conflict and want different things. And it's kind of like our mind is the rider and our body is an elephant. You know, why do we eat cheesecake when we want to get healthy? Well, that's the elephant going off the path and we're the rider, so we need to direct it. That sometimes, you know, if we make bad decisions, it's just because our elephant is off doing crazy stuff. We need to work together with our mind and our body to get on track and achieve the best results possible. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, it's just a cool metaphor to kind of put things in perspective. Next point, where does happiness come from? Little story, I was backpacking and I stayed in a monastery in Thailand. And I remember being there and we would meditate for eight hours a day. I wasn't very good at it, um, but I admired the people that were good at it. And there were these monks up there and I, I got a chance to talk to them how, who had been there since they were four years old. This was their whole life was sitting, meditating, existing. And that's kind of like the Eastern view of enlightenment that what makes us happy is to rid yourself of attachments, right? That's the Buddha thought. It was one of the four noble truths that uh, desires create suffering and suffering is brought out from attachments. So if you want to get rid of suffering and be happy, get rid of attachments and so you own nothing. Well, that's one viewpoint, but what's the other viewpoint of the extreme? It's kind of the Western capitalistic, climb the corporate ladder, get buried with your Ferrari and win the game of life. And that doesn't really make people happy. We know that the West has severe depression and all those kind of have it all, lose it all stories like Wolf of Wall Street style, right? But sometimes happiness does come from external things. It does feel good to get some sort of notoriety or some sort of achievements. And then it also comes from within, like the Eastern viewpoint we talked about. It is fun to sit there and meditate and you feel good, you feel happy. But what's the middle path? If those are two extremes, what's right there in the middle? Are there things worth striving for? And the answer is absolutely yes. It's not about worshiping attachments. It's not about ridding yourself of attachments. It's about finding and striving for the right attachments. That's what makes us happy. Next big idea, probably one of the best ones from the book, is the adaptation set point. Now, if I told you there were two people, one person just won $20 million and the next person got paralyzed from the neck down. And I asked you to predict a year from now who was going to be happier. We'd probably go with the lottery winner, right? But that's not always the case. In fact, there's good studies uh, in this book that are talking about how we adapt to whatever we have around us. And so if you look at that $20 million lottery winner, who's supposed to be so much more happy because they have all the money in the world, well, a year later, they are closer to their homeostatic set point. So is the paraplegic. Basically, bad things happen, good things happen. We, we get used to it, and then we come back to baseline. You know this from your own life, right? Uh, you ever get a big TV, and it looks huge for the first week, 
and then you kind of adapt to it and now it's just another TV. Or you ever get in a hot tub, right when you put your foot in, you can barely stand in it because it's so hot. And then after 10 minutes, you're like, this thing's not hot enough anymore. I want, I want some more warm water. It's kind of like that with anything in life. We have this adaptation set point. So with happiness too, our baseline level of happiness, which is determined by a lot of things we'll get into in a little bit, um, is a good determining factor of happiness. Researchers call this, who study this uh, adaptation, they call it a hedonic treadmill. That if we think that material things like big screen TVs, cars, uh, new apartments, new clothes, whatever, are going to be the end all for our happiness, it's kind of like we're on a hedonic treadmill. So we're hedonists just running on this treadmill that spins faster and faster and faster and faster. So once you get uh, the new car, well, now you're in a completely different bracket of people who you're comparing yourself to who have better cars. And so you have to up that. Okay, now once you have a car that costs luxury, like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, you're comparing to $100,000 cars. $100,000 cars, two hundred fifty, dollars and it keeps going on and on and on. And that's what happens. We adapt and then we recalibrate where, whatever we're at. The next point is the happiness formula. Again, probably one of the best points of this book. Really cool breakdown of how do we take all this positive psychology science out there and distill it down into a formula that we can look at and be like, oh, okay, that's happiness right there. Right there on paper. Uh, just a couple things. This is what makes someone happy. You want to know the happiness formula? I'll give it to you. Let me look it up. It is H equals SCV. Those letters stand for happiness equals set point plus conditions plus voluntary actions. So happiness, H, self-explanatory. Um, set point, we went over with the adaptation. So wherever we're naturally set at could be a lot of factors like genetics, um, overall environment, kind of mood, where we are on an average day, that set point plus conditions, so external things of our life, like our job or our relationships or our work, how satisfied we are with those, plus voluntary actions. So voluntary actions are things that you can do to make you happy, like meditating or good health practices, going to the gym, getting sleep, thinking better thoughts, reading books, all journaling, all these things, those are voluntary actions. Now add those all together, and you'll get a score of happiness. Those are the conditions that create a happy life. And in the book, he talks about right before that, that, uh, that plants are really good at taking a beating, that you can pretty much kill a plant, and if you start taking care of it right before it dies, it'll spring back to life. So in other words, you can kind of neglect that plant, and if the conditions are poor, it's gonna die. But if you get all the conditions right, if you start watering it, put it in your windowsill, maybe change the soil out, give it some fresh air, then it springs back to life because the conditions were there. So with that happiness formula, not to overcomplicate this, but it's almost like those are the conditions you need to focus on. And so if any one of those, your set point, your conditions, or your voluntary actions, look at all three of those and, and focus on how can you set those up to uh, uh, be like the water, the soil, the air, and spring back to life. Well, sometimes, I mean, your set point sucks. Maybe you have genetic predisposition to depression. You know, that's, that's reality. That's not going away, okay? But you can focus on those other two things, maximize them, and hopefully boost your happiness. Maybe your conditions aren't good. Maybe you don't like your job. Maybe you're unhappy with it. Maybe you're stressed. Maybe you're not in a relationship that's supporting you. Maybe you wish you were in a better financial situation. All right, well, those are conditions. You can improve on those and increase your happiness. And then the last one, your voluntary actions. Maybe you haven't been to the gym all week like myself. You've just been slacking like I have. Um, those are conditions we can improve on and increase our happiness. Okay, so it's a really cool practical way. I love that formula. And it's definitely a big point of this book. Next point, this is love and attachments. Really love this one, pun intended, right? Oh, dad joke. Put a video up about uh, two years ago on the love of two kinds. And this is where in this book, it goes over that there's two kinds of love out there. The first one is passionate love. This is the Mexican soap opera where they're slapping each other and then they're making out the next scene. 
or the Thai soap opera where everyone's getting shot in the hospital and then all of a sudden start making out, right? It's it's that crazy kind of hot in love phase. Um, it's what every single romantic comedy is based off of or the notebook, right? This is passionate love. It burns really hot. Then there's the second kind, which is compassionate love. What if we put those on a graph? And passionate love starts off really, really intense. And over six months, it kind of has its peaks and valleys and then dies out. Now, compassionate love on the other side, which is built on more trust, um, almost friendship, getting to know the person, all that sort of stuff, caring about them, yada, yada, yada. That doesn't start out as high. It doesn't have the the uh, catch-up fights and <laughs> the rain makeout scene. It starts lower, and it has a slow build. Now, look at that after six months. You look at the two, and you're like, hey, passionate love seems like a way better way to do it. But what happens if we change that six-month time frame and look at them over 60 years? Now it's something way different, and compassionate love started slow, but it was more sustainable. Passionate love dies out, fades away. All right, the next point is happiness suckers. What are some things that just flat out take away from happiness every single time? They're not getting better, so we can avoid them. Well, there's a couple he goes over in the book. The first one is noise. This has been linked to higher stress levels, ambient noise, just noise all around. Maybe you live by a busy uh, intersection. That's going to take away from your happiness because you're stressed out more. All right. The second one is commute time. We never adapt to our commute time. If you have a 40, 50, 60 minute commute, you're not gonna adapt to that. It's not gonna get easier as the years go longer. It's gonna be the same stress level roughly the whole time. So a good way, just becoming aware of that, that that's a stressor. I'm not sure if that's always true. I think with audiobooks and podcasts, you can kind of reduce that. I think you can have a good time on your commute if you really want to. Um, But that on average does take away from happiness. Next one is lack of control. We're going to go over and stumbling on happiness, autonomy, and that feeling like we have control over things in our life is kind of the wellspring for human happiness. That if we feel like we're in control of things, we feel like we got this, okay? We're, we're good. But when we start getting depressed, anxious, overwhelmed, is when we feel out of control, when we feel like we can't control things no matter how hard we try. We have this learned helplessness. So we'll go over that in another video, but lack of control is a huge determining factor on if we're happy or not. Next one is shame. Reducing shame will increase your happiness, but having lots of shame, kind of self-explanatory, carrying around guilt, shame, regret, all that stuff, um, will decrease your happiness. So maybe you need to talk to a close friend about things. Maybe you need to go to therapy. Maybe you need to journal, brain dump. We have videos on this channel about that. Reducing shame will increase your happiness. And having a lot of it, it's going to decrease it. The last one is dysfunctional relationships. It's not about if you fight. It's about how you fight. So if you're not in a communication dialogue with someone that's healthy, it's going to take away from your happiness going to cause a lot of stress. Surprise, surprise. I mean, I'm sure you've had a time where you've been fighting with someone or you got a text, we need to talk. And that's all you can think about for until you talk to that person. Or maybe you've had a poor interaction uh, with a boss or a coworker and you walk away from it. And it's what you think about when you go home at night. I mean, that's totally normal, but that's going to take away from our overall happiness. So getting better communication skills to deal with those kinds of situations will increase our happiness. Cool five factors that we can become aware of and hopefully minimize to uh, increase our happiness. What about things we know scientifically boost our happiness every time? First one, strong marriages. Uh, I don't know where you're at in your life. If you're married, plan on being married. I'm 24, so I got a little bit before I'm, I'm gonna be married, but good to think about that the stronger your marriage on generally, the happier you are, okay? So um, that's one. Second is physical touch. Actually being in physical contact increases happiness. Now, don't get crazy. It doesn't always mean sexual. It just means hugs or actually like a pat on the back or a back rub or um, just physical touch with people. We need that interaction. And that you can actually see, you know, when infants are are 
aren't touched when they're in their incubator and they're crying all the time, well, not touching an infant has been linked to uh, detrimental effects of their developments. They don't process the same emotions. They have lower empathy. Oxytocin isn't released as high. It's a, it's a physiological component of health is physical touch. Next one is meaningful relationships. So having friends in your life that you have a deep connection with, you feel close to, you feel like you've invested in. Uh, we went over it in the seven habits of highly effective people book review, I believe that um, shared experiences are some of the best way to forge intimacy that feeling of closeness with people. And that's why fighter pilots, war veterans, soccer players, people who live in tight-knit communities have deeper ties and social relationships because they have more shared experiences. So whoever, whomever your friends are uh, that you have shared experiences with, those nourishing those relationships, you'll get a lot out of them. And the last one is religious affiliation. Uh, that was a shock in here that religious people are on average report greater levels of happiness and meaning than non-religious people. I think it was only by about 10% or something like that, but nevertheless. Next point, valuing constraints. In the book, there was a section that people um, who were most likely to kill themselves, commit suicide, were the ones who had the least constraints. And that was really fascinating to me uh, because you always hear constraints in this negative connotation that, um, you know, oh, I have so many constraints. I'm so stressed. I have so many obligations. But he frames it that, you know, you need constraints to have things worth living for, to have things worth uh, taking care of, to be needed. That's a very beneficial point of living. And I think I would agree. I think that we have this negative viewpoint when you hear commitment. Uh, that's a constraint. But look at the thing. You know, I don't want commitments or, oh, I, I don't like to commit to things or I'm scared of commitments. Um, but look at the things in life that do take commitment. School takes commitment. Education, um, meaningful growth, striving towards goals, relationships, raising a family. I don't know what your values are, but those are some of my highest wants, my highest needs, and they all take commitment. So commitment isn't a dirty word that we should be afraid of. Constraints isn't a dirty word that we should be afraid of, but we need to embrace having constraints and commitments and view it as a positive thing that increases our happiness, not a negative thing that's limiting our freedom. Next point is on goal attainment that there's two kinds of happiness when we have goals. There's pre-goal attainment, so setting the goal, having the journey, and then there's the post-goal attainment of when we actually reach it. And that sometimes that pre-goal attainment is more beneficial than that post-goal attainment. You get, in other words, you get more happiness out of working towards something than you do actually achieving and hitting the mark on the goal. Tony Robbins has that great bit on the astronaut syndrome. The fact that what do you do when you've gone to the moon and back? You've trained your whole life for this. You come back down as an astronaut. You shake the president's hand. You get your plaque on the wall. Now what? What do you do? And so you can trace high links of depression and alcoholism, drug use to astronauts. There's they, In other words, they hit their goal and they're wondering... Now what? Not all of them, but, you know, a good amount. So happiness comes in working towards things. And it's that pre-goal attainment. And if we just focus on the outcome of that post-goal attainment, we're missing the whole point. All right, the last one, we're going to end this shebang on a quote uh, from the book. It says, I don't believe there is an inspiring answer to the question, what is the purpose of life? Yet, by drawing on ancient wisdom and modern science, we can find compelling answers to the questions of purpose within life. Happiness is not something you can find, acquire, or achieve directly. You have to get the conditions right, then wait. I love it. It's all about focusing on what we can do. It's all about maximizing that happiness equation, getting our conditions right, and minimizing distractions. Keep improving, keep striving, and keep accepting. That is it. Happiness hypothesis, boom. 
that is our fourth book if you missed the other ones i'll link them in the description down there uh four hour work week the one thing and the seven habits of highly effective people so far this book get it on amazon link in the description below if you want other ways to increase your happiness i would recommend boom you do the 11 questions change your life 100 percent free ebook i put out all you have to do put in your email they'll get sent right to you these are the best 11 questions you can ask yourself if you want to live the happiness hypothesis in real life all right next week i uh, gotta get back to you on which book we're doing haven't decided yet but until then thank you so much for your support give me a big thumbs up and a comment down below what was your favorite point do you agree or disagree on any of them and let me know in the comments down below start the conversation have a good time all right that's it i love you guys stop settling start living see you next time